evil come together strange as neighbors our blood is one and children of generations of every nation of kingdom come so don't let your heart be in trouble and hold your head up high don't fear no evil and fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from.
we're gonna sing a new song together today. I'm excited about this song. It's all about God's power. It's all about his faithfulness. Listen, I know sometimes that life can just come along and, and knock the breath out of you. It can knock the breath out of us. Sometimes it's like as if we're staring into a situation that is hopeless. Well, we know that that's not true. We know that God is love, God is hope, God is faithful, and he is good. And we declare that today. We know that God makes a way in the wilderness. He provides streams in the wasteland. He turns graves into gardens. He makes a way. The seas that are before us, he parts. He goes before us. God's love endures forever and his faithfulness continues through all generations. The chorus of this song that we're gonna sing today simply says, there is nothing better than you. There is nothing better than you. If you're anything like me, then you've, you've searched the world looking for that fulfillment. And again, if you're anything like me, you've, you've come up wanting, you've realized that this world has nothing to offer that will last. And it's Jesus and him alone. And so we're gonna declare that together. We're gonna sing that together. And I search the world but it could have filled me And man's empty praise And treasures of fate Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied here in your love and who oh, there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you Better than you 
now we're going to take communion together. No matter where you are, we get to share in this together. So hopefully you've had opportunity to get some bread or crackers and some juice. These are the elements we use to remember the body and the blood of Jesus. Jesus asked his followers, when we come together to partake of this little meal, to remind us of his love, his sacrifice on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sins. So I'm gonna pray. And after I've had a chance to pray, we're gonna meditate. And during that time, after you've had a chance to just reflect and to thank God for what he's done for you through his son, Jesus Christ, then you can partake of these elements together. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for what you've done through your son on that cross that has paid all of our sins. As we come to you, our sins are washed away. And we have this hope of eternal life. Father, we take this bread to remember his body that he gave, that um, he had hung on, a, on that cross. And we take this juice to remember his blood that he shed to pay the penalty for our sins. Father, thank you. Be with each person as they partake. May they remember and may they be filled with gratitude. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey, community family, it's been a great day of service out here today. We've been serving for a number of hours. It's been this strategic partnership that we've had with our, our mayor, Michelle Gomez, the mayor of the city of Tamarack. She's been leading out on this, a partnership with an organization called Feeding South Florida. BSO has been leading and being involved in this and navigating the traffic through all this. And Yezzy, who's right here, is our outreach director. Yezzy's gonna share some of the stats, but it's been an amazing day. We've been more than just sharing food. We've been sharing hope with people. We've been the hands and the feet of Jesus and we're just making a difference. And I just wanna thank you for the way you support us as we support others. Mayor. Thank you very much, Pastor Scott. It's actually an honor and privilege to partner with you with Community Christian Church. Your volunteers are amazing. Yezzy's amazing. The pastors are amazing. And thank you so very much. I love our BSO. They've been great and thank you very much. All of our volunteers and our City of Tamarack Park and Rec, thank you as well for helping coordinate. Thank you so very much. Hey, community family, I am so excited. We had such an amazing morning. We fed close to 1,500 families and over 100 volunteers showed up to serve. Guys, this is what it's all about. This is what outreach is for. This is what being the hands and feet of Jesus is all about. And I'm so grateful and blessed by everyone here today. You guys rock. Woohoo! Woo! Last Monday was such an awesome day of service. We really did make a difference in the lives of other people. As I said on the video, we not only gave food, we, we gave hope in Jesus' name. And it was such an incredible time together. Friends, we're still on point on our mission, which is to change the world one person, one family, at a time, and we're doing that through opportunities to serve. And for those of you that volunteered and served, thank you so very much. For those of you that give, thank you very much because your generosity is fueling initiatives like this, it really is. And so thank you for your faithfulness in the midst of this crisis, this pandemic that we're all walking through together. At the end of the service, I just wanna invite you again, like every single week to go to our website and you can give online or you can text to give or you can, you can mail your offering in to the church, but thank you for your generosity. One of the reasons that we give is to make a difference, to change the world, but that's not all why we give. 
We give because God gave to us. He gave us the indescribable gift in Jesus for God so loved the world that he gave. And so because he gave so much to us, we, we respond to him and we give back to him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, a day that we can celebrate your goodness, that you are a good God, that you are for us, that you're not against us, that you're moving in our church, that you're changing lives, you're changing us, you're doing a work in and through us. So God, I, I thank you that, that we have this opportunity to give because uh, we're able to not only to make a difference in the lives of others, but we're also able to express our deep joy and gratitude to you for what you've done for us through Christ Jesus. Bless these gifts now. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, mom's happy Mother's Day. I mean, today is a great day. I mean, I wish we could all be together that we could celebrate and honor you. I hope that you're already being celebrated and honored and treasured at home. I hope that it's an incredible day for you. Typically when we're together in the auditorium at community, we have you stand, I'm not gonna ask you to do that. You just sit back and relax wherever you're at right now. But I hope that you're being honored. And one thing that we are doing, it's the next best thing to having you stand and recognizing you. There's a video that we prepared for you. So mom, um, happy Mother's Day. Here you go. Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? Isn't she precious? Such a beauty. Again, happy Mother's Day, moms. Uh, I hope it's a, an incredible day for you. I wanna wish my wife, Lori, a happy Mother's Day. I already did that before I left to come in this morning. Lori is, is a great mom to our two boys, Chris and Steve, and she's a great grandmother. I, I, wait, let me back up a little bit. She's a, an awesome grandmother. Uh, she's not a great grandmother yet. I mean, Jeremiah's turning five in a couple of weeks. And so uh, hopefully that's great grandmotherhood is off in the future, a couple of decades or so. But she is, she's a great uh, mom and, and grandmother. She really is. For those of you that are not grandparents yet and you wonder what you're gonna be called. Let me tell you what you're gonna be called when uh, your grandkids come along. You're gonna be called whatever your first grandchild calls you. That's what you're gonna be called. Lori wanted to be called Gammy. She even has a t-shirt that says, uh, keep calm, Gammy will handle it or something like that. She never wears it because she's not Gammy anymore. Jeremiah couldn't say Gammy, but he could say Gaga. And so Lori is Gaga to all five of our grandchildren. As I've told you, I'm married to Lady Gaga. So anyway, let's jump into our message. We're wrapping up 
our teaching series, Anxious for Nothing, Overcoming Worry and Fear. This is part four in this series. I hope it's been helpful for you. It's been helpful for me as I've revisited some themes that I'm aware of, as I've learned some things along the way as well. See, anxiety is an out of control thought pattern. It, it just is. It feeds on the what ifs. It feeds on the worst case scenarios. And anxiety, it's not harmless. Anxiety it's toxic. It really is. There's, there's a card that reads, if you're tempted to worry, remember that a raisin was once a happy grape. <laughs> Friends, we need to be reminded that worry, it just shrivels us up. It, it really does. It's toxic to our souls. Jesus told us his purpose statement in John chapter 10, verse 10, I've come that you might have life, life in all of its fullness. And he also, he warned us against worthy in Matthew chapter six, verse 25. He says, do not worry about your life. And if you're consumed with worry, you certainly are not living life to the full that Jesus intended for you to experience. We've been in this series, Anxious for Nothing. It comes from a verse of scripture in Philippians chapter four, actually from the King James version, the new King James version it says, be anxious for nothing. Max Licato wrote a great book called Anxious for Nothing. And I love this quote that I've shared each week that I've spoken. It says, the presence of anxiety is unavoidable. The prison of anxiety is optional. You see, we're trying to jailbreak from the prison of anxiety. We don't wanna live there. We don't wanna be trapped there. That's not a thing where we wanna be. We wanna say, not today, worry, not today, anxiety, when we feel anxiety coming our way. There's a, a man by the name of Arthur Summers Roach who said this about worry. Worry is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. If encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. Can you relate to that quote? What's draining your thoughts these days. Maybe it started as a thin stream of fear and now it's turned into a raging river of anxiety in your mind and you're doing everything that you can just to keep your, your mind, your head above the water line. The latest stats show that some kind of anxiety disorder attacks about 40 million Americans. This is pre-COVID now, so I know it's much higher than that. In fact, all of us wrestle with anxiety or worry to some degree. For women, it's the number one mental health issue. For men, it's number two after drugs and alcohol. And I'm guessing that men use drugs and alcohol to cope with anxiety, and that's why it's number two. And we all cope, we all struggle, fight battles with anxiety because of uh, our circumstances. It might be physiological, it might be emotional. All of us have to do battle with this. And we've been looking at what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter four. That's been our text. It's a very familiar passage of scripture. We've read it each week in our, in our previous three lessons together. Now here's the context. Paul is writing these words from a prison cell in Rome. He's, he's chained to a Roman guard 24 seven. He's under house arrest, he's quarantined. Now that's what I've told you so far. And the image of that, you know, okay, he's, he's, it's, he's, he's in a house. It's like he's got an ankle bracelet on. He can do his own stuff. It's, he's quarantined, not, not, not too bad of a deal. But I neglected to tell you the rest of the story, the backstory of what goes on. Paul's in Rome. At this point in time, when Paul is in Rome, Nero is the emperor of Rome. And Nero was just famous for being crazy and evil, a bad combination. He despised Christians and he was famous for persecuting them. Nero would force Christians into gladiator matches and they would be eaten alive by lions. And Nero would take the carcasses of Christians and he would dip them in tar or some kind of a substance and use them to light up his garden for his nightly garden parties. If anyone should ever be anxious, it should be the apostle Paul. Historians tell us that Nero condemned Paul to death by decapitation, to have his head cut off in, in Rome. So it's in that backdrop that, that Paul is living under the possible execution when he writes these words to his friends, this church at Philippi, from this Roman prison cell. Philippians 4.4, 4, we read, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Just think about somebody being able to say that with this cloud hanging over them. Verse five, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now we got this idea from Max Lucado, again, who wrote the book, Anxious for Nothing, to use 
the acronym CALM, whenever we feel worry, whenever we feel anxiety coming our way, and we've been working through one of the letters of uh, the acronym CALM, C-A-L-M, each week. And, and I think it's really helpful because if you feel worry coming on, then you just work through the CALM acronym. The first, the C in our CALM acronym is celebrate God's goodness. We rejoice in the Lord always. Why? Because he is the Lord, because he's in control, because the Lord is near, He's not far away, he's for us, he's not against us. He's as close as the air that we breathe. He's close to the brokenhearted. We celebrate the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the greatness of God. And then the A in our CALM across, our CALM acronym, I go back and forth between an acronym and an acrostic, ask God for help. There's no problem that is too big for God's power and there's no worry or problem that's too small for God's concern. And so if you have a problem that is big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. We cast all our cares on him because he cares for us. And then last week we talked about the L in the the word calm. List what you're thankful for. I believe that gratitude is one of the most powerful weapons. We talked about fighting our battles and we use the the weapons of praise and thanksgiving. And, And so gratitude, thanksgiving as As gratitude, thanksgiving goes up, anxiety goes down. It's just truth. And gratitude turns what we have into enough. And if you missed last week's message, I really want to encourage you to go back and and watch that online. It's on our website, uh, communitycc.com under messages. And you can see that, or you can go to our YouTube channel. And we talked last week, and we were talking about, about list all the things that you're thankful for, that rather than a Christmas in July, maybe we have Thanksgiving in May. Well, I got a, a text from a friend, Danny Perez, that just had some pictures of their Thanksgiving meal that they just had this past week. There was a big turkey that was carved and there was dressing and gravy. And I go, way to go, that was so awesome. Thanksgiving in May. Thanksgiving, it chases worry away. Gratitude chases anxiety away, it just does. And today we come to the M in our CALM acronym. Meditate on good things, meditate on good things. There's tons of things that are types of different uh, meditation and lots of people practice it in some form or another. The Bible talks about meditation. And so when the Bible talks about meditation, it's not talking about getting your hamstrings in an uncomfortable position. It's not talking about that. It's not necessarily talking about emptying your mind and it's not bad to empty our mind as long as we do what the Bible says is to fill our mind. That's what the Bible talks about meditating is filling our minds with good stuff, positive stuff, life-giving principles, life-changing perspectives, and we just meditate on good things. And so here's the last part of our passage. It's Philippians chapter four, verse eight. These are the words of the apostle Paul, so helpful. Paul said in verse eight, finally, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So we meditate on those things. Fill your mind, meditate on the kinds of things. If you want a new and better direction for your life, then you need to create a new playlist for your mind of the things that you listen to, the things that you you have. You get true and noble and right and stuff in there and it, it influences your thinking. And when it influences your thinking, it influences your behavior in your life because the way we live is always a reflection of the way that we think. It's just truth. Scripture says in Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. What makes you, you, what makes me, me is how we think. True change always begins in the mind. It just does. I love what John Ortberg says, becoming the best version of yourself rests on one simple directive. Think great thoughts. Think great thoughts. You may be saying, Scott, I'm not into this whole motivational Tony Robbins thing. And I've been honest with you. I prefer his brother Baskin. I do. But I got to tell you, there's a real value in thinking great thoughts. Negative thoughts cannot lead to a positive life. They just can't. And so we guard what happens in our mind. Look at what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12, 2. He said, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. And I'm sure that Paul changed the way that that he would think about things, changed his perspective. And that's how he's able to write what he wrote toward the end of his life to his friends at the church in Philippi. Let me give you two words that have helped me through all of this, feed and focus, feed and focus. Those are important words. 
What you focus on will feed your mind, and your mind will determine the direction of your life. NASCAR drivers are very careful what fuel they put into their high-performance cars. We know that. Pilots are pretty selective about what kind of fuel goes into their jets. Athletes are very disciplined about the food, the fuel that they put into their bodies, and choosy Mothers choose Jeff. We know that. We've been told that. And so again, happy Mother's Day, moms. Thank you for choosing what is good for your kids, whether it's Jeff or Peter Pan, peanut butter or whatever. Uh, just thank you for being who you are. Many of us forget this principle when it comes to our mind that we practice thought management. You can pick what you ponder. You really can. You can choose what you think about. Proverbs chapter four, verse 23 says, be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. And we can feed our minds just junk food and think about junk things again and again and again. It's gonna affect us, it's gonna come out. It always keeps me from becoming who God wants me to be. That old adage is true, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. I mean, we become what we think about. And if you're always thumbing through magazines or scrolling through various feeds, looking at celebrities that look at, live lives of the rich and famous and it, it can mess with you. It can mess with your contentment. It can make you insecure. It can make you feel less than if you constantly do that. It can skew your perspective on the value of stuff and the place of things in your life. If you feed your mind pornographic images, it does something to the way that you view other people. It does something to the, to the way that you view relationships. It objectifies people. And whether it's movies or music or conversations or jokes or video games or social media or political opinion shows, we have to be careful what we're constantly feeding our minds. If you spend a lot of time watching shows like Meet the Depressed, it's going to affect you because my mind and your mind will be shaped by what we feed it. it. They just will. There's a guy by the name of John Graham. He's a professor at Harvard University. And he says that most Americans determine our worry targets, the things that we worry about by the TV that we watch. And most of our local TV stations and just almost every TV station, probably nationally, has this unstated motto, if it bleeds, it leads. I mean, the news is typically just negative. They might have a nice little story at the end to kind of mitigate some of what they've told us throughout the previous 28 or 29 minutes. But I wanna encourage you, and I, I mentioned this in week one, limit the negative inputs in your life. I, I read that in an email and it just kind of grabbed me, limit the negative inputs in your life, because I think it's more critical than ever to control the inputs in your mind. We're in a crisis. Much of the news is bad, but, but the news that we're hearing is not just the news. They're not just reporting on what's happening. I mean, they're speculating, they're forecasting this horrible future. And if you immerse yourself, if you become a news junkie, I can almost guarantee that you're going to be dealing with anxiety on a much higher level if, if you do that. And so just determine that when it comes to the news, you get in and get out. You, you find out what's going on, but you don't camp out there. You don't spend time there. I wanna show you that scripture again, Philippians 4 verse eight. It says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I emphasize the word whatever, because it's as if Paul is saying here, it doesn't really matter. You just focus on whatever is true or whatever is noble or right or pure. And there's so many things in life that, that are noble, so many things in life that are good, that are true. And, and you focus on those. And maybe it's stuff like for you. I, I mean, I, I love focusing on sunrises and sunsets. It's like when God just takes his paintbrush and, and, and he just paints this majestic painting for us. And it's incredible. And there's just something that's restorative about watching those. To be honest with you, I prefer sunsets to sunrise because they, well, they come later in the day. That's just me. I'm just letting you know about that. But I, I love the ocean and I love being there and seeing the vast ocean. And I love hearing the waves crashing. There's something that happens inside of me when I'm around that kind of water. And it's just this peaceful and it's calm. And I can tell you that we're probably going to be about a million of us are going to go out to the beach as soon as we're allowed to do that. And so I'm sure there's going to be really effective social distancing happening at that point. I love when I go fishing because when I go out fishing, it's just 
peaceful and calm. I was thinking the last time I went out fishing that I might put some music on and, and listen to it while I'm fishing. And I go, yeah, I don't want to do that. I don't want noise. I just want to listen to the birds chirp. I just want to listen to, to, the, the, to the gators roar. I just want to experience that. I, I love the peace and calm, but I love my grandkids. And whenever I'm around them, it's not peaceful. It's not calm, but it's a, something that just is good and restorative for me. Maybe music you listen to because it can lift your soul. Maybe reading a good, a good book because you get lost in a great novel. You watch a great movie that just moves you and inspires you. I, I say all those things because there's so many things that are good. I love what Lewis Smeads says about this. He says, God is so great that he does not need to be our only joy. There's an earthly joy, a joy of the outer as well as the inner self, the joy of dancing as well as kneeling, the joy of playing as well as praying. So whatever is true or noble or right or pure, God's able to speak into your life and to, to shape you in ways. And so you find out what, what does something inside of you, what recalibrates you. Ask God, what can I feed my mind so that it can flourish? And he'll show you all kinds of things that will help you filter, filter out what isn't helpful and what is helpful. And certainly God's spirit, the Holy Spirit will always point you to the source, the ultimate truth, the word of God, the truth about life, because friends, this book is the truth. And so when we think about, we think about things that are true, we're always driven back to the word of God. One of the things I can tell you about my life, when I meditate on things that grow out, out of this book, it always feeds me, it renews me, it realigns me, it recalibrates my life and, and it even calms me down. I, I love what John Wartburg writes about the Bible. He says, one of the greatest gifts God has given the human race is scripture. Yet we often turn it into a burden. Sometimes people will ask me, how many minutes a day am I supposed to read the Bible? Seven, 15, <laughs> Ortberg said, what's the, people ask him, what's kind of the minimum that I can read the Bible and not have God mad at me? He goes on, he says, that's the wrong question. God's not mad at us for not reading the Bible. No matter how much we read the Bible, he won't love you any more than he loves you right now. And then Ortberg says this, he says, the question is, what can you feed your mind with so that it can flourish? That's the question. Because we, what we put into our mind is gonna come out and it's gonna, it's gonna change the direction of our life. The reason to read the Bible is not to get extra credit with God. The reason to read the Bible is not to get so much knowledge so that you can smoke somebody in Bible jeopardy. That's not the reason. It's to plant yourself by this life-giving river. I love Psalm chapter one. It talks about people who plant themselves by this life-giving river of the word of God. Psalm one, verse two, it says, but they delight in the law of the Lord. Meditating, there's that word, the Bible uses it. Meditating on it day and night. They're like trees that are planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither <clears throat> and they prosper in all they do. And here's the liberating thing, the freeing thing. The job of the tree is not to produce fruit. The job of the tree is just to plant itself by the river. And when it does that, the fruit's gonna come. It's naturally gonna come. It will produce fruit. That's why the apostle Paul wrote in Colossians chapter two, verse seven, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong and the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. One of the ways that I'm learning to let my roots grow deep is to meditate on the truth of God's word. And friends, here's the, the old adage is true. If you can worry, you can meditate. So for those of you that just feel that you're constantly worrying, I wanna give you some good news. You've already developed the right practice where you turn something over and over and over in your mind. We just need to change what you're, what you're focusing on. And rather than turning over this worry that this, this is gonna happen, it's gonna be horrible, it's gonna be terrible, you replace that and you meditate on good things, you meditate on the word of God and, and God will replace your anxiety with a peace that transcends human understanding. For instance, how do you do this? You, you might read a verse that, that says in Psalm 33, 22, let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. 
You begin to turn that concept over and over in your mind. You, you begin to say, God alone has unfailing love. Where can I find unfailing love? Only with God. And he loves me. He's for me. He's not against me. He's with me. He's near. And you just turn that over and over and over in your mind and you turn that and, and you play that over and over in your mind and, and it's gonna chase the worry away. It is just gonna do that. Or you read this verse, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I, I can give this to God. Why? Because he cares. He really does care for me. So I'm gonna trade this burden. I'm gonna trade this concern, this worry. I'm gonna give it to God and I'm gonna exchange this for his peace. That's just incredible that this peace that comes from him, I'll, I'll trade this for his unexplainable peace. Just turn it over and over in your mind. Friends, this is such a big deal that you just turn these, you turn over and over again, these truths in your mind when you feel worry coming your way because life gets hard. It gets hard for all of us. We get, well, the hope knocked out of us. It just happens. And when it does, the enemy will begin to speak to you. Maybe he will shout to you. Maybe he will whisper to you lies. Lies like, God doesn't really love you. Why are you putting your confidence in him? You should be freaking out right now. You should be responsible for your family. You should be so overly concerned about everything that's going on. You need to be anxious. Anxious for nothing? You gotta be kidding me. What are you smoking? Anxious for everything. Think of all the what ifs. Think of the worst case. He doesn't care about you. But when you're sensing that and it's coming your way, you feed your mind the truth, you meditate on the truth and then you begin to see those lies for what they really are. You let the truth, you, you meditate on things, you think good things, you meditate on things that are true. Joshua chapter one, verse eight begins, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. It's talking about the law of God, the, the, the word of God. And then you'll be prosperous and successful when you meditate on it. And then a very familiar verse of scripture, Joshua chapter one, verse nine. I read this one frequently not verse eight, but eight goes before nine. Verse nine, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified, do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And you can be strong, you can be courageous when you meditate on the word of God because it will displace the worry. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. I love that song. I ask our worship team to sing that today because it may feel like we're surrounded by all of this, these issues, these problems, these difficulties, but we're surrounded by God. The Lord is near. We celebrate him and we're strong and courageous. Now, if, if you wanna start a new chapter in your life, you need to start turning the pages of God's word and then turning them over and over in your mind. The Center for Bible Engagement recently surveyed 40,000 Americans from the age of eight to 80, and they discovered something that they were not even looking for. Uh, this, this is amazing, incredible. And, and if you've been kind of just, you know, autopiloting on this message and, you know, paying your bills or doing something else, I want you to come back in. I want you to really focus because this is big time stuff here. They discovered something they weren't looking for. Those who read the Bible one time a week maybe saw or maybe saw a verse of scripture you know, during the service like you have today. They saw just a negligible difference in their life, their anxiety levels, their habits, and their behaviors if they only engage with the Bible one time a week. Those who read the Bible two times a week, they also saw only a negligible difference. Those who, who read the Bible three times a week, they experienced a small blip on the radar, kind of like a, a heartbeat during an EKG. But here, here's where it gets interesting. This is what shocked the researchers now. Those who engage with the Bible four times a week or more, there's this huge jump. There was this life change spike that was just off the chart. Listen to this. They found that reading the Bible four times a week or more resulted in significant life changes, such as feeling lonely drops 30%. Anger issues drop 32%. Bitterness in relationships drop 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Viewing porn drops 61%. And then on the positive side, sharing their faith jumped 200% because they had so much confidence in who God is. Serving others, living beyond themselves, jumped 230% because they see it in the word of God and they're called to live a life of giving and sacrifice and service and not just 
narcissistic, self-absorbed life. So maybe we, we, we should engage, you think? <laughs> you think with, with God's word? When you and I, when we regularly and consistently feed our minds, it matters, it transforms us. It's why guys like the apostle Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, richly. We'll be people more effectively equipped to win over worry when we fill our minds with, with God's word. I can't ever do a message like this without mentioning the YouVersion Bible app. And I had to go to their website again. And the latest is this, over 420 million downloads of this Bible app that's free, by the way. And I know that there are just hundreds, maybe thousands of us in community in our church that use the YouVersion Bible app on a regular basis. And it'll help you read the word of God. And if you're not used to reading the Bible on a regular basis, there are Bible reading plans for those that are new to reading the Bible. And, and I tell you all the time that, that I, I listen to the Bible on my phone. I put the headphones in and I just listen. I'll hit play and I'll just play chapter after chapter. This week, I, I listened to the first 30 chapters of the book of Psalms. And I go, okay, yeah, there's that song that we sing. There's that song that we sing. Because so many of the songs that we sing are based out of the Psalms of the Bible. And you can just, well, you can wash your mind. You can, you can chase away worry. You can begin to fill your mind. And when you approach God's word and you try to meditate it, you might find these three R's helpful. Relax, reflect, and respond. You relax in the truth that, that God is God. He's the Lord. He's for you. He's not against you. You relax in his grace. You relax in his mercy. You relax in his unfailing love. You just kind of relax. And then, then you reflect on your own life. The situation, the stage of life that you're in, you, you, you reflect on your season of life, your relational world, and say, God, what are you trying to say to me right now? And then you reflect. And then the key really is to respond. God, what do I need to do? What is the application that you want me to take? How do I apply this in my marriage? How do I apply this? As a parent, how do I apply this in my job? How do I pl apply this in the midst of this pandemic? And then you actually apply it in those situations with other people. And when you do that, it, it changes you. It changes you. Eugene Peterson, who authored the message paraphrase, say, said this, Christians don't simply learn or study or use scripture. We assimilate it, take it into our lives in such a way that it gets metabolized into acts of love. You see, Real change starts taking place when I begin to respond to what I'm seeing and reading and hearing in the word of God, what I'm chewing on, what I'm turning over in my mind again and again. When I read about encouraging others, I, I don't just let it stay there. I, I actually, you know, I write a note of encouragement or I send out a text to somebody or, or I call them. When I, when, I, when I don't just listen to talks about serving others, but I decide that I'm actually going to serve other people, I'm gonna do the dishes, I'm gonna vacuum the, the floor without thinking that I deserve a medal of honor or something. I begin to change when I don't just read verses about the cries of the poor, but I respond to the cries of the poor in a way that God leads me to do that. And, and instead of just reading the Bible, my anxiety starts to, to dissipate when, when I throw it to the one who cares for me. It says, cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. And when I feed my mind those things that are good and, trouble, good and true and, and noble and pure, then I begin to actually do those things. It changes my life. It changes my heart. It, it, it changes me. Friends, there's a ton of great resources, great podcasts that are out there, but, but there's nothing, nothing that compares to this book, the word of God, that will transform us. And I'm convinced that this book is the single most indispensable tool. It's our weapon. It's our weapon to battle against the evil one that we have in our disposal in life. And this book tells us how to build a life. It tells us how to, to build a marriage. It, it tells us how to parent our kids. It tells us how to handle money. It tells us how to handle conflict and relationship when it comes. It tells, tells us how to you know, be a, a good employee or a good employer. It, it, it tells us so many different things, how to, how to get along with other people. The book tells us about life after death. It tells us about hope of heaven. It, it tells us about a cross where Jesus died to take care of our sin problem. It tells us about an empty tomb where Jesus was victorious over sin and death and, and how he just conquered it all. And when you feed your mind with the right stuff and you churn that over and over and you feel like anxiety coming your way, it's like anxiety is knocking at the door. I want back in, I want back in. You go, sorry, <laughs> not today. 
The room's full. There's no place for you. There's no space for you. You can't get in because my mind is full because you've filled your mind. And if your mind is full of things that are true and noble and pure and right and admirable, there's no place for anxiety to get in. And you're just saying, not today, not today. So when you feel fear coming your way, worry coming your way, anxiousness, coming your way, if you want to maintain a sense of calm, you think back to this acronym, you celebrate God's goodness. You ask God for help. You list all the things that you're thankful for and you meditate on good things. And when you work your way through that calm acronym, friends, I gotta tell you, anxiety will begin to melt away. It will be chased away. It doesn't mean that you're never gonna have anxious thoughts come your way, they will. They will, but you don't have to live in a prison of anxiety. God doesn't want you to live there. Anxiety will melt away. We'll begin to experience a peace that transcends human understanding, a peace that will guard your heart and your mind as you live in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I, I thank you for today. I thank you for the series that you've given to us and especially as we understand a little bit more about uh, what the apostle Paul was facing when he, he wrote these words to us. If there was ever a person who should have been anxious, it should have been him. And he demonstrated it's possible to chase those anxious thoughts away. So Father, I, I pray that we would be intentional and diligent, that God, we would limit the things that we allow into our mind, that we, that we would camp out on gratitude, that we would celebrate those things, God, that we would know that you were near, that you were close, that you, you care deeply about us, that you want us to cast our burdens to you, and God, that we would meditate on, on good things and we would just be discriminating about what we would allow into our minds, God. I, I, I pray that this week and next week and the week after will be different because we follow the encouragement, the inspiration, the admonition from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.